everyone. Can you just comment if you can see us, hear us okay? As per usual, then we can get started. All five people, seven people. I wish it would tell me straight away. <laughs> people have probably commented already, but I just can't see it yet. We've got Annabelle, Claire, Charlotte. Come on, if you just comment. Hannah. Thank you, Charlotte. Okay, so good morning, everyone. It's a bit earlier today. Um, Martha is awake, so I will mute in my mic just because she's been a pain and she's been doing all sorts to me this morning. So, what a disturbing. <laughs> Um, we've got Emma Parr this morning from Emma Parr Embracing Natural Pregnancy. She is in the group, so a few of you might recognise her name. She's been very helpful. Um, she was also one of my midwives that helped deliver Martha, which, so it's nice to see you again. Um, yeah, if you've got any questions about anything she's talking about, please just pop them in the comments as per usual, and then at the end I will read them all to her. I'm sure she'll be happy to answer. But other than that, Emma, thank you. Hi there everybody, um, like Jade said, I'm Emma Parr and as well as being a midwife in Leicestershire, I've got my own business, um, Embracing Natural Pregnancy, which um, looks, I use remedies and complementary therapy like massage and reflex and things um, for um, pregnancy symptoms. Um, today I'm here to talk to you about pain relief in labour. Um, and I'm sure that most of you have probably heard by now that labour can be a little bit painful. Um, so I'm sure you're after any tips and advice and um, things about how you might be able to help with that pain um, and what options might be on the day. So I'll start by talking about um, what will happen perhaps in the early stages of labour. It's a bit that you might be doing on your own at home um, uh, with, your, with your partner before you get into the hospital. So the early stages as your contractions are starting to build up um, what I would normally what I would suggest is that to start with you just try to ignore it as best as you possibly can um, try to focus on something else take your mind off it sort of a distraction kind of um, a thing um, just keep busy um, you know do some jobs around the house that sort of thing um some people find that making making sandwiches ready for taking into the labor ward you know making yourself a little bit of a picnic i personally did the ironing while i was in early labor at home um as as the contractions um then sort of build up then um you'll start to start to find that you won't be able to focus and concentrate on what you're doing um and that you're going to have to stop what you're doing when you have a contraction and that's when you kind of need to start doing perhaps some sort of breathing exercises now um when you're in pain it's very um quite tempting to sort of hold your breath and go quite tense um and unfortunately when you're quite tense actually that makes the pain worse so what the best advice is is to keep going with that breathing and on the breathe out, really sort of blow out and let everything relax, okay? And when you're relaxed, that generally helps with the pain and makes it a little bit more easy to deal with. Um, also, again, the breathing acts as a little bit of a distraction um, from, from the pain. Um, moving on from that, you might want to sort of try perhaps some different positions. So you might find that um, you're more comfortable perhaps standing up. Um, than if you're sitting down. Some people find that it's really difficult to lay down while they're in labour. Some people find that actually it's more comfortable um, having a bit of a lay down um, when you're in labour. Sometimes, particularly in the early stages, um, and your contractions aren't regular, when you lay down, that will sometimes slow your contractions down a little bit um, and might just sort of give you a little bit of much needed rest. Um, but if you if you want to encourage your conditions, then being upright, walking around. Um, if you've got a birthing ball at home, that's a really good position for um, for before labour even. But in the early stages of labour, sitting on a birthing ball um, is just a brilliant position. It's almost like a supported squat position. 
and your body's nice and upright you've got your your pelvis is kind of open in that squat position allowing maximum space for baby's head to be moving into your pelvis getting into position um ready for labor so you know that's that's all good um, if you haven't got a birthing ball, some people find sitting on the toilet is a really comfortable position. Um, again, similar similar sort of position to sitting on the birthing ball. It's that supported squat position. Um, kneeling, all fours positions, sitting on a chair, sort of facing backwards over the, the back of the chair. Um, so sort of sometimes will relieve if you've got pressure in your back. Um, other things that you can try at home are perhaps a soak in a nice warm bath. Um, so it's those kinds of those kind of things that perhaps you might do if you would have some period pain, for example. So go and have a soak in a nice warm bath, or use a hot water bottle, either on your back if you're getting lots of pain in your back, or um, sort of on your on your tummy at the front. Um, obviously, you don't have the hot water bottle too hot, but um, but that can offer a little bit of um, comfort. So, um, as I said, I, I work a lot with um, the natural remedies and complementary therapies and things. So, um, one of the things I do a lot of is aromatherapy. So, that is the using um, that is using um, essential oils, uh, which have got all sorts of different um, amazing properties, which can help with various different things. Um, such as um, helping you to relax. There's some oils that are really good for encouraging your contractions to become stronger and closer together. Um, there's some oils that are good if you're feeling sick. Um, so, you know, aromatherapy is definitely um, something that might, might just help, um, particularly in the early stages, but also as you move on through your labor. Um, aromatherapy can be used um, in your bath uh, until the point where your waters have broken. Generally, we say if your waters have broken, not to use essential oils in the bath. You can, however, still use them for inhalation, so breathing them in um, from a tissue or um, from a massage. So you could perhaps get your partner to give you a nice sort of back massage if you're getting lots of pain in your back. Um, in your shoulders sort of help you to to relax you know remembering that breathing and keeping relaxed remembering that keeping relaxed is going to help with the um with the pain so if anybody wants any any sort of information about the use of aromatherapy oils and essential oils at any point during your pregnancy or um for labor then by all means get in contact and i'm quite happy to make up sort of labor blends and things like that if anybody's interested um, the other things that you, you could try at home are just your simple um, sort of paracetamol tablets, two paracetamol tablets, perfectly safe to take um, in pregnancy, and it might just sort of help to take the edge off um, those contractions that you're getting. And particularly if you're in the very early stages, say it's the evening time and you've been getting a few sort of tightenings and things as the evening's gone on, and you think, oh, this could be labour starting, Go and have yourself a soak in a nice warm bath, a couple of paracetamols and get yourself into bed. You're not going to sleep through the labour. It'll definitely wake you up. Um, and at least that way you might get a little bit of rest um, before, you know, things really, really get going. Um, you know, labour can take a long time. And if you've had had a whole night of sort of up and pacing and waiting for it all to get going um, and then in the it really kicks in, of course, you've had no sleep, and that makes things um, a little bit more hard. Um, so the other thing that you could try at home is a TENS machine. Um, I don't know whether you've heard of the TENS machines. Um, they can be used for all sorts of pain relief um, during, during pregnancy, and also um, you know, non-pregnant people use them after surgery or people that have sort of pain in you know specific parts of their body can be used all over and basically um the 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 way that the tens machine works so tens actually stands for transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation so um it's a little um what you get is a little little box i've got some pictures because i thought it might kind of kind of help um so i think you can see that one at the top maybe um 
you get a little box and then there's four little pads that are attached to the, the battery powered box okay and then the pads then go onto your back so you fit two of the pads low on your back sort of just above where your your pants would probably sit and then the other two sit a little bit higher probably whereabouts um your bra strap would go and um you, what what um what it does is it produces tiny little pulses which block the nerve pathways which carry the messages the pain messages to your brain um, and it also stimulates the production of your body's own natural pain relieving endorphins so it's a, it's a completely drug free um, method of pain relief um, so you know it's perfectly safe for you and the baby okay um, I will come back to um, the a bit more information about the TENS machine in a minute. Um, so those those are the kind of things that you could probably do in the early stages of labour at home. Um, once you get to the hospital, then you've got slightly more options available. Um, so then you've got things like the birthing pool, which um, which you might like to, to use, similar to using a bath at home, I suppose, but a little bit a uh, little bit bigger means you can move around. A a little bit more easily get into more positions um whereas a bath you're a little bit more restricted um and you're kind of in that laying kind of position um again aromatherapy um like i say i work in leicestershire um as a midwife and in leicestershire we have got quite a lot of our midwives are now trained to provide aromatherapy for ladies during labor so if it's something that you're interested in using then certainly once you get to the hospital, um, ask about aromatherapy and hopefully there'll be somebody um, that would be able to, to help sort of choose a blend for you that's going to work um, for your you know, particular needs at that time. Then um, the other types of pain relief are then your more sort of drugs-based drugs, drugs based things. So you've got the, um, the Entinox or gas and air um, and you've got um, an injection which in Leicestershire we give pethidin um, I know that a few of you are from sort of other other areas um, and I know that they use different sort of forms of the injection um, to, to the pethidin that we use in Leicestershire um, but pretty much you know they all work on the same kind of principle and then finally uh, you've got your epidurals um, so those are those are kind of the uh, the pain reliefs that are available okay um so told you a little bit about i told you a little bit about aromatherapy so the other things um so aromatherapy um we don't use it in the pool um but we do use it like i say for massages and for inhalation so the midwife might be able to pop a few drops of the relevant oil onto say a little bit of a tissue that you can then um can breathe those in um the benefits to having them as a massage is that as well as the effects that they have when you you sort of smell the oils which smell lovely um if you have it in a massage um with some uh, carrier oil then it actually gets absorbed through your skin and into your bloodstream and works that way as well so it's sort of like a bit of a double whammy um so you know we can use if you're getting lots of back pain for example we use some pain relieving oils um and and sort of massage those into your lower back into your hips where you might be getting some of that pain um, and that can really help with the pain but also again a massage is usually quite relaxing and like I said earlier the more relaxed can keep you um, the the easier it is for you to be able to deal with the pain um, there's also oils so um, you know if you're getting a little bit sort of stressed a little bit scared that kind of thing again we can use um, oils to help to sort of calm things a little bit um, and just to kind of help you to relax um, oils we can also use those 
postnatally. So really good for um, helping stitches to heal um, and um, we can use them for people that are having breastfeeding issues and they can be quite useful for reducing um, postnatal depression. So um, um, essential oils, you know, really are really useful um, for you to use at any time during your pregnancy. However, um, when it comes to essential oils, I want you to remember that just because they're natural, they're not drugs, they, um, they're not safe for everybody. There's some oils that um, we would recommend that you don't use in pregnancy. Um, they can lead to sort of um, problems and, and things and even lead to uh, miscarriages. Um, so, you know, it's really important that you know what you're doing with the oils and that you use oils that are, one, safe for you to use during pregnancy and also that they're used at the correct age so that you dilute it um, sufficiently before you bring it on in a massage, um, that you don't sort of put too much in your bath. Um, it's not like a case of the more of the oil that you use, the more likely it is to help. Um, it can sort of go the other way and actually make the problem worse. So like I said earlier, if you've got any questions about um, essential oils, please get in contact with me um, and I can give you some, some advice about those. So, I said I'd tell you a little bit more about the, um, the TENS machines. So, um, basically, what I'm going to do is sort of go through the advantages and disadvantages of each of the methods of uh, pain relief. So, the great thing about your TENS machine is that you are in control. Okay, you decide how much um, you sort of, how, how strong the electrical stimulation you want. So basically you get, um, I mean, there's the various different types um, and basically you usually get like a little handheld um, box or a little handheld thing like, uh, like the one in the picture there, which um, you can change the frequency and the strength strength of the electrical uh, impulses that um that are going through it generally in early labor you're going to start it off as soon as you start to feel contractions or pain i would say pop it, put your tens machine on it's never too early to put it on um and it's always better to put it on early and then it builds up with your contractions um because you start it off at a low frequency and then as your contractions become stronger, you build it up as, um, as your labour goes on. Um, it's never going to take all of the pain away. Um, so, you know, it's, it generally sort of is going to take the edge off things. Now, quite often, ladies will get to the hospital wearing their TENS machine and then they'll say, say to, to me, oh, take it off. It's not doing anything. Um, you know, it's not helping at all. Take it off, take it off. And then you take it off. And that is when you realize how much it was actually helping you. Um, and the, the pain will sort of increase in intensity. Um, and it is then difficult to pop it back on again because it needs to then kind of build back up again. Um, so the other advantages of the TENS machine are that obviously you can walk around you're not sort of uh, restricted movement wise um, like I say it's drug free no known effects on the baby um, it can be used at home for backache so if you were struggling with backache at the end of your pregnancy um, it's possible to use your TENS machine even before you go into labour um, it might just help with, with that sort of back pain that you're getting um, the other thing thing is that um, as well as the little control box you get like the little handheld thing um, and every time you have a contraction you then press the button which then boosts the intensity of the um, electrical pulses that are going through it um, so that it gives you an extra kind of boost of pain relief during the contraction when you really need it um, so it can be used alongside other forms of pain relief. So um, you can 
can use, for example, the aromatherapy. Um, well, you can take paracetamol and use it. Um, and you can you know, use it while you're sitting on your birth ball. Um, it's a little bit difficult to do the massaging if you've got um, a TENS machine on, but it can be done. Um, we can kind of work, work around it, or you can get your partner to work around it. Um, the only thing that you can't do is obviously to go in the water. Electricity and water do not mix. So, um, you know, take it off if you're going to be going in the bath. We obviously would take it off if you're going to go into the pool um, once you get to the delivery suite. So the disadvantages of it really are that it's probably not going to, you know, it's not going to take the pain, or pain away and chances are you are going to need some other form of pain relief as well as the TENS machine um, as your labour progresses. Um, and the other sort of disadvantage, I suppose, is that I think that you would hire for your um, buy. Now, um, it's important really or best that you get a maternity TENS machine. Like I said earlier, TENS machines um, can be used for all sorts of different types of pain um, and not just for labour pain. The difference with the maternity TENS machines for labour are that they have that boost button that I was telling you about. Um, so, you know, they boost it during contraction. The normal TENS machine doesn't have that boost function. Um, so, you know, see if you can get hold of a maternity one. Now, there's lots of places uh, on the internet that you can hire them from. Usually cost around about 25 to 30 pounds to hire. And um, they send you the everything that you need um, in the post uh, at around about 36 weeks or so or whenever it is that you uh, you decide to, to get it. And um, then you get to keep that until after you've had your baby. Once you've had your baby, you post it back to them um, and, and that's it. So, you know, relatively easy, but it is something you need to have organised before you go into labour. Um, it's not something that we have a hospital, we can provide you or anything. That is something that you definitely need to um, organise yourself beforehand. Okay, so um, so those are the kind of things that you can be doing at home anyway. The once you get to the hospital, like I said, um, you've got a possibly um, be able to use a birthing pool. So many of you might have been thinking about using a birthing pool. I know that Jade um, used the pool um, and found that really really useful. Um, it is really relaxing i always say to ladies it's like you like when you've had a really stressful day and you run yourself a nice deep bubble bath and you get in and you just go oh and you relax relaxing is so important during labor and it really does help with the pain immediately that effect when you get into the pool is amazing you know it really really helps right from the second that you get in the other great thing about the pool is that um, the water takes your weight. I'm sure towards the end of your pregnancy, you'll find finding that it's difficult to move around. It's difficult to sort of, you know, turn over in bed, all those kinds of things. In the pool, it is much easier to be able to move. Um, the other thing is that it's um, helpful to be able to get into those positions that we say are really good for having your baby in. So like I was saying earlier, that squat position or kneeling positions, basically positions that aren't laying flat on your back. Gravity definitely helps when you're in labour. The baby is moving downwards. So if you can be in an upright position, then obviously that's going to help um, with gravity, with baby moving downwards. Um, so because the water takes that weight, you can get into sort of those kneeling and squatting positions, which you just would not be able to maintain those positions for long on dry land. I don't know about you, but I mean, I couldn't, couldn't uh, maintain a squat position for probably 10 seconds and I'm not going to know. <laughs> um, you know, if you were pregnant, I really think you're going to manage that, that position for very long. Um, so the pool is definitely useful for that. 
Um, the other things that the pool um, is actually improves the blood flow to the uterus and increases the so that's another um, benefit um, and also the research has shown that you're uh, an increased chance you've got an increased chance that you will have a normal delivery if you are in the pool um, there's a lower chance of you having um, more severe tears down below at delivery if you've delivered in the pool um, it might also shorten your labour um, and most in the pool are more likely to report that they've had a positive birth experience um, than if they haven't been in the pool. The other thing about being in the pool is that um, again you can use the gas and air whilst you're in the pool. Um, other forms of pain relief, like I say, you can't use the TENS, tens machine while you're in the pool. Um, the other things that we talked about, so the pethidine injection, epidurals, can't be used whilst you're in the pool. Um, but you can have paracetamol and we can use some of the aromatherapy. So like I said earlier, we don't put the oils into the water, um, but we can still use the oils for inhalation. Um, or perhaps for you know sort of shoulder massage um, when your shoulders are out of the water or sort of hands and things can be used for massaging as well. The disadvantages are that you need to be 100% low risk to be able to go into the pool. So um, if you've had any problems during your pregnancy, we've got any concerns about you or the baby um, or perhaps you're on medication and things, um, then it might be that the pool isn't going to be an option. Um, it does make it slightly more difficult for us to monitor the baby. So if you've had a high-risk pregnancy, um, it might be that they want to monitor baby's heartbeat continuously, uh, which is something that isn't very easy to do in the pool. There are a few monitors that are able to do this, but... It, it isn't it isn't ever so easy um so generally if you've had any risks we'll be advising that don't use the pool uh, the thing is is that birthing pool night might not be available when you want it so um i don't know some of you might have might have heard that the birth centers at the leicester general and the leicester royal and um, some of the other local birth centres. So I think the sanctuary at QMC is currently um, not available, uh, which means that the birthing pools are currently out of action. Um, however, there are birthing pools available at St Mary's Birth Centre. And basically, if you have had a low-risk pregnancy, then it would be suitable for you to have your baby at St Mary's if you wanted to. Um, if you want more information about having your baby at St Mary's, there's information on the Leicester Maternity website, or by all means, get in contact with, with myself. Um, I am one of the midwives that works at St Mary's, um, and I also work at the Leicester General as well. Um, at St Mary's, they have got two large plumbed-in pools. Um, so if you're at St Mary's, there is a pool available um, for you for labour, providing that um, you're suitable to go. The only sort of disadvantage of the pool, really, is that occasionally it can relax you so much that your contractions actually slow down. Um, and unfortunately, you know, we need those contractions to get this baby out. Um, so we don't, once we've managed to get you into labour, we don't really want things um, stopping. So sometimes if we get you into the pool, contractions slow down, it's necessary then to perhaps get you back out of the pool to see if we can uh, encourage them to speed back up again. Um, but yeah, the pool, I would definitely um, advise the pool I've, I've laboured in the pool um, with two of mine and delivered my, my third baby in the pool and yeah, amazing, yeah. So other forms of pain relief, so I mentioned the, um, the gas and air or the other word that we might use is entonox. So the uh, gas and air is a mixture of oxygen 
and nitrous oxide, which is basically um, laughing gas. Um, and it's available in delivery rooms. Um, at the main hospitals, it's um, it's sort of, you know, in um, becomes sort of into the room like the oxygen um, from, from the wall is a constant supply. At um, St. Mary's and Deaths and things, portable oxygen um, and knock cylinders which can go to wherever you need them so if you're in the pool or you're in the bathroom those kinds of things then you can continue to use the the gas and air um, so the gas and air is um, is done via a um, like a, a mouthpiece with a filter and things on it so you so I'm just trying to show you a bit of a, a picture there can you see it yeah um so you can see there that it holds onto the onto the uh ent -nox and you've got a little mouthpiece that you pop into your mouth and take some nice deep breaths of the gas so the advantages of using the gas and air are that you're in control so you decide when you start breathing breathing it in you decide how much you breathe in um obviously the harder you breathe um, the more of the gas you're going to take in um, and uh, yeah, the more sort of effects that it's going to have. So you often find people will start off and they're just taking sort of small breaths of it. But as the contractions build up um, and they get used to using it, then you start taking bigger, bigger breaths of it. Um, so there's no evidence that it causes any harm to mum or baby, which is another you know great advantage of, of the gas and air. Um, it's available everywhere. So, like I say, at the uh, at the main hospitals, we've got it at the St Mary's Birth Centre. Um, if you're choosing to have a home birth, then the home birth midwives will bring um, gas and air with them. They have the portable cylinders. Um, so it's one of those that's available to you, no matter what, really. Um, it also works immediately. So you, you start breathing it in and then within sort of 10 to 15 seconds, it's starting to have an effect. So it works quite quickly. It's then also back out of your system quite quickly as well. So um, once you've stopped stopped breathing the gas gas and air, it, um, it's quick out of your system and you sort of return to normal. Um, it does tend to make you a little bit, um, a bit just spaced out, I suppose, of a, a drunk kind of feeling. Um, some people like that feeling and other people aren't quite so sure. Um, so one of the disadvantages is that it can also make you feel a little bit sicky. Quite common that the first sort of few contractions that you use it, it does make you feel sick and then you kind of get used to it and your body sort of um, responds a little bit better to it and you, that sicky feeling goes. So don't sort of dismiss it after just one contraction you feel sick you know try and try and bear with it and usually that sick feeling does tend to go but it isn't for everybody um so it does make you concentrate on your breathing so like i said earlier it's very tempting when you've got pain to hold your breath and be tense you can't breathe the gas in um whilst you're holding your breath so it does make you breathe and again remember to concentrate on that real sort of blowout the further you can blow out and relax Course, the more you can breathe in with the next breath. Um, it can be used alongside other forms of pain relief. So like I said earlier, you can use it while you're in the pool. Um, you can use it um, once you've had the pethidine injection. So the, the two can work quite nicely together. Um, and you know, occasionally if you needed to use it um, when you've got an epidural, again, you can use the gas and air. Um, the disadvantage is, like I mentioned, that some people just don't like that feeling of feeling drunk, be feeling a little bit spaced out, can make you a little bit out of control, I suppose. Um, but it does it does go very quickly once you've you've started taking some, some breaths of the fresh air again. The other thing is it makes your mouth quite dry. Um, you're breathing, taking you know big breaths of um, the, the gas in, so it can dry dry you out. So make sure that you've you've got um, some water. Keep taking lots of sips of water so that you don't get dehydrated. Um, 
So that was your guess. That was the information about the gas and air. So the next one um, to talk about is the pethidine. So pethidine is an injection that you we usually give it into your thigh or into your bottom. It's a morphine-based drug. It just sort of helps you to, to, to relax. Um, and when you're relaxed, it just helps helps the uterus to work a bit more effectively. Um, again, it can make you a bit drowsy, a bit sleepy. Um, again, some people don't like that feeling. However, if you've had a particularly sort of long build up to this stage, or you haven't managed to get any sleep, then it might be that you have some pethidine and it, you know, at least you can get some of that well rest. And occasionally people do manage to fall asleep and labor progresses quite nice and quickly as you're asleep. Um, and you know, you wake up ready to have your baby, which is amazing. Um, another benefit is that it can be given by the midwife so it doesn't have to be um, given by a doctor or anything like that um, it is available again like I say at St Mary's Birth Centre as well as the main hospitals um, and can be used with the other forms of pain relief the only thing that we say is if you've had pethidine we don't like you to go into the pool for a few hours afterwards just because of it making you drowsy we don't want you falling asleep in the pool. It's <laughs> no good idea. Um, so the advantages of pethidine are, um, like I said before, it can make you feel a little bit sick, a little bit dizzy. However, there is an anti-sickness drug that we um, we usually give with it anyway, because um, we know that that is one of the common side effects of pethidine, that, sick, that, that it makes you sick. Um, so, you know, if, if, you, if you feel that you are particularly likely to feel sick, then mention that to your midwife and ask if you can have the anti-sickness um, with it. Um, the, own, the other disadvantage, um, which, is, which is a reason that a lot of people choose not to use the pethidine during labour, is that it, can, it does have an effect on the baby. So as well as making you a little bit sleepy and drowsy, it can also make baby um, sleepy. And for that reason, we don't like to give it too close to delivery. Because when the baby's born, um, we don't be sleepy, we want to be nice and awake and take those first sort of breaths um, and start breathing on its own. Occasionally, if you've had pethidine too close to the delivery, um, baby can come out a little bit reluctant to do those first breaths. There is, however, another drug that we can give um, to reverse those effects, um, but also the effects of the pethidine can stay in the baby's system for a couple of days afterwards and um, can occasionally affect um, baby's feeding. It's just a little bit sleepier than normal and a little bit reluctant to feed as well. Um, so that, but it's, it's there is a there is an option and it definitely um, definitely has its place. Um, if it's something that you're thinking about, speak to your wife about it um, when you're in labour and she can say whether she thinks that it would be um, beneficial for you to use that. So the biggie that um, I'm sure you're all wanting lots of information about is um, the epidural. So an epidural is um, the injection that you give into your back, which it, the aim is to take all of the pain away um, so that you can't feel your contractions or you can't feel the pain from your contractions at all. You generally can still feel that you're having a contraction, you can still feel pressure and things, a little bit like if you've ever had um, local anaesthetic when you've gone to the dentist for a filling, say, um, you still feel that somebody's, you know, touching your mouth and things, it's just not painful. So an epidural works um, in a similar way to that. So basically, an epidural is um, done by an anaesthetist who is specially trained um, to do that. Um, and he will um, give you a pain relieving injection first and then the epidural is inserted through a hollow needle 
and it goes into a little into the epidural space in your in your back um, once it's in then um, you are left with a very very fine tube in your back through which we can give you more um, of the painkiller through um, to make sure it continues to last all the way until you've had your baby and afterwards so um, I've got a few pictures so um, again this top picture here is the position that we would need you to get into um, when you're having your epidural inserted so the person standing in front of the lady there that is probably wife and then they're working behind the lady, that is the anaesthetist. And we usually do it in that sitting up position with you kind of folded over um, your bump um, in, to open up all the spaces and make you to sort of stretch your spine out as much as possible to make it um, easy um, or as easy as possible for the anaesthetist to find the correct space. Now, um, it can be occasionally a little bit difficult for them to find that space. Sometimes they manage to go straight in and within minutes it's in. For other people, it's a little bit more difficult um, for them to find the space that they need and may take a little while. Um, so once, once they've managed to find the space and they have it in place, then they will stick it down on your back like this okay so there's no needles left in your back once it's once it's done it's just stuck into place and then i don't know whether you can see on this um this the last little picture here then you end up with just a very 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 fine tube in your back and then this little um this little bit here is the bit through which we can inject more of the um the painkiller to keep the epidural working and um, for as long as you need it to so, um, you know, there's no, no need left in your back. Well, that's often uh, what a lot of people worry about is the needles um, with, the, uh, with the epidurals. So, um, the advantages of having an epidural, like I said, it is the only form of pain relief that is going to completely take all of the pain away. Um, because you're, you're not got any pain anymore, it might be that you're then able to get a little bit of sleep or at least rest, um, particularly if you've been doing going through labour for a long time, you might have been being induced, that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, you might be absolutely exhausted at that point. So, you know, at least you'll be able to get sleep. Um, epidural can help to reduce your blood pressure if you've been suffering with high blood pressure during your pregnancy. So often the doctors will recommend um, for you to have an epidural if you have been having raised blood pressure. Um, the other good thing is that if you were to, say, to have, um, say, a forceps delivery or von twos or even a cesarean section, they can top up that epidural so that it um, is is able to be used as sufficient pain relief for you to have an epidural uh, for, for you to have a cesarean section. The other thing is that. Um, it doesn't doesn't generally have any effect on the baby at all. It's, it's contained in the epidural space, the drug, rather than um, going into your bloodstream, or only a very very small amount ends up in your bloodstream. Um, the disadvantages of having an epidural um, are often the things that uh, that put people off from having them, because uh, you know to to be able to have a labour without any pain sounds sounds perfect, doesn't it? However, there are some disadvantages to the epidural. So um, an epidural, like I said, has to be done by a doctor, which means that you would need to be in hospital for you to be able to have an epidural. Um, and um, it's not something that's available for you to have either at home birth, for example, or at St. Mary's Birth Centre. Um, because it has to be done by a doctor, um, it takes a little while to get it organised. What I generally say to ladies if I'm looking after them and they're thinking about having epidural is it takes probably about an hour from you saying to me, I think I'll have an epidural, to you being sat there with a smile on your face. And that is because there's various things that we have to do before we can sort of put the epidural into place. So if you're having an epidural, you have to have a drip. 
So before we can start popping the epidural in, we have to make sure that you've got a drip in your hands so that we can give you some fluids. We have to find the anaesthetist who could be busy doing an epidural for somebody else. They could be busy um, assisting in theatre with somebody who's having a cesarean section, for example. So it might be that you're not able to have that epidural immediately. Once the anaesthetist is available, it then take they, they have to sort of um, have a bit of a, a chat with you to make sure that you're aware of all the risks and the benefits um, and what you're agreeing to. And then, um, and then it takes quite a lot of setting up. It's a sterile procedure, um, so as to not introduce any infections into your spine. Um, so that in itself takes a little bit of setting up, making sure that everything's clean, everything's sterile. The anaesthetist will wear a gown and sterile gloves and things. Um, so again, that's obviously um, takes a little bit of time. The actual putting the epidural bit in can actually be quite quick, um, providing the anaesthetist is able to find that um, point, then it can be, you know, sort of a couple of minutes and it's in and ready to go. Once they found the right place for it, it then can take about 20 minutes or so for it to take full effect. So as you can see, it's not a, you know, it's not a quick fix. Um, like perhaps the gas and air that's available immediately and works immediately, um, it, it does take a little bit of time. For that reason, if we thought that as midwives that you were going to perhaps um, deliver within the next hour or so, it might be that we say to you, you know, it, it might not be worth you having the epidural because I think you, you could well have delivered by the time it really starts to take effect. Um, so other disadvantages are that um, occasionally it doesn't give you a complete block. So the aim is that it will block from sort of um, the top of your tummy down to your pelvis. Um, occasionally you will get a little segment that doesn't, it just doesn't affect, it doesn't touch that particular nerve for some reason. Sometimes um, they can readjust it and that seems to work. Occasionally they have to start all over again and see if they can um, reposition it completely um, to get you that pain, that total pain relief. Um, the other thing is that you would need to have your baby's heartbeat monitored continu continually. So although we talk about it being a mobile epidural, you're not terribly mobile because you've got a drip in one hand, you've got a baby being monitored um, on the other hand. So we generally need you to be sitting on the bed um, and it's not like you wouldn't really be able to sort of get up and walk around. You can move around on the bed. You're not completely paralysed from uh, from the, you know, the chest down or anything like that. You can still move, you can still feel your legs and things. They're just a little bit heavier than normal. Um, so the the other sort of disadvantages might be that um, I think because of the where where it numbs, it can also mean that you lose a little bit of sensation in your bladder, which means that you might not be able to feel that your bladder is full and that you need to pass urine. Um, if that happens, then sometimes we need to pop a catheter in to make sure that your bladder remains um, empty and you don't end up with other damage and things. Um, so I think that's, that's um, all the information about all the different forms of pain relief. Um, I'm not sure, Jay, did you have a couple of questions that people had got about pain relief? Just turn my mic back on. She's been a nightmare, <laughs> so I'm glad. I do apologise for everyone who can just see the corner yeah. of it climbing over my head and things. <laughs> right. For me, you're not just in the corner, you're like full on on the I know, screen I so I can that. see everything she's like, up to. You're doing so well keeping a straight face when she's like, oh, dummies down my top and everything. <laughs> um, so I do apologise, people. Um, yeah, I've got a couple of questions that were pre asked and some have come as well in the live. Um, okay. Sarah said, Can medications cause hallucinations? I suffer with anxiety and so I'd want to avoid any that do. 
Okie dokie. So generally, I would say um, the, the pain relief that we use isn't going to cause hallucinations. Um, I mean, obviously, everybody is slightly different and the effects that um, the drugs have on people are, are slightly different. However, the gas in there, like I say, it can make you feel a little bit drunk kind of feeling um, and a little bit sort of, it's almost like a little bit of an out of body experience. <laughs> Um, so, you know, the good thing about the gas is if you try it and you don't like it, you don't use it again. You know, it's not one of those um, that you've, you've taken it and you've got to wait for the effects to wear off. It is literally, you know, 20 seconds after breathing it, it's back out of your system. So from that point of view, I think that would be fine. Um, pethidine, similar to the, to the gas and air makes you feel a little bit you know drunk feeling i suppose um but the disadvantage with that one would be that once you've had that injection you know the effects of it can last sort of a couple hours or so um there's no kind of um you know going back or quickly quickly reversing the effects of of the pethidine so you know it might be if you're a little bit worried that that's something that you perhaps don't try However, what I would say is if you're if you do suffer with sort of anxiety and things, that aromatherapy might be something that works work well for you. Um, you know, you could have a blend that is good for relaxation. Um, some of the oils are really good for reducing anxiety and things. So, you know, perhaps that's something that you could look into. Um, using the birthing pool if you're low risk would be brilliant. Um, again, if, if you are low risk, to go somewhere like St. Mary's um, to have your baby would would be really beneficial. Thank you. Um, Mia, I have a mild form of pectus excavator, <laughs> that's a mouthful, and I'm worried about the added pressure on my heart and lungs during childbirth. Which medications won't add to this or exacerbate the breathlessness and tiredness? So, I must admit, isn't my specialist subject um however i think um that what you're talking about it's a, a sort of a um condition with the chest which can affect your breathing and heart and things um, you, it was it was mild um i presume you've been seen by an obstetrician at some point during your pregnancy to discuss this and if they think it's necessary then they would put what we call an intrapartum care plan into place um, after they've discussed with you. Um, so they're probably the best people to talk to about um, because if, if it's a respiratory thing, you might find that the gas and air doesn't work terribly well for you. Um, but, and it might be that for you to reduce the stress for you, to your breathing and extra stress on your heart, that they recommend that you have um, that you have a, an epidural um, early in your labour just to sort of ensure that you stay sort of relaxed. Um, so, you know, that might be some, something I would definitely suggest that you speak to um, the obstetrician about. Thank you. Um, Eliza, I've quite a severe phobia of needles. I have to use numbing cream for all blood tests, etc. The thought of an epidural terrifies me. Is there a way of dealing with this? So, compulsory so um, you don't have to have the epidural if you don't want to and what I normally say is that actually if everything goes to plan in your labour and you go into labour on your own you arrive at the hospital and you're already in you know in good labour your contractions continue that actually your body is designed to be able to cope with labour pain it's when we interfere in that process. So if we um, suggest that you're induced or we use drugs to speed up your labour, we give you a drip to increase your contractions. Um, if we you know, say that we want to monitor your baby's heartbeat continuously, which then restricts your movement a little bit, then all of those things kind of mean that you're actually more likely to need to have the epidural. Um, so, you know, if everything everything goes to plan 
um, and you're, you are sort of low risk, then hopefully an epidural isn't going to, to actually be necessary. Um, but um, you said you said sort of phobias and things. Is this something that you have sort of um, talked to somebody about? You know, is it something that perhaps I don't know how many weeks pregnant you are? Is it something that perhaps you could speak to somebody about? Perhaps you know therapy um, for for phobias um, to see if you can actually um, solve solve or improve your phobia a bit. Um, you said that you generally use the numbing cream before you have injections. Is that something that your GP normally prescribes for you? Um, you know, I'm not too sure how you do that. We generally don't keep it at the hospital. Um, so if it's something that you think that you might need to have, then it would be worth speaking to your GP beforehand and seeing if you can get that as a prescription so that you can apply it um, before going into the hospital or before needing to have any of those um, those injections or needles. If you were having um, an epidural, then like I said, you do have to have a drip into your hand first before you can have the epidural. Um, so of course the numbing um, cream on your hand might be beneficial there. Um, on your back, when they do the epidural, they do give you some local anaesthetic first, which it does sting when it goes in, um, but then it does numb the area. So, um, so hopefully then you wouldn't feel them giving the epidural. Um, again, the other thing that might be really useful for you, again, would be the aromatherapy oils. Um, you could try sort of an inhalation there. So if you had a blend um, of oils made up for you that you use, you sort of have a few breaths of that before going ahead it might be that it just kind of you know helps a little bit to take your mind off things um so you know, that's that's sort of a, another option but at the end of the day what i normally say is if you're in that much pain you get to the stage where actually if they said they were going to chop your left leg off you'd say yeah do it um so so you know it might be that actually if you found that you're in that much pain and discomfort that you needed an epidural but actually you're prepared to you know <laughs> to forget your phobias and fears and things um for a minute while it's done i'm so sorry she's being a pain <laughs> <laughs> it's all right um, Gemma has a question regarding the tens machine can she use it at home for lower backache um she's 36 weeks pregnant and type 1 diabetic Yep, so um, TENS machine, like I said, you can definitely use that lower backache. Um, so, yeah, yeah, use, yeah pop, pop your uh, TENS machine on. Um, obviously, you won't need the boost button, but the TENS works by um, boosting your body's own natural pain relieving endorphins. So that will, will you know, hopefully help with that back pain. Um, some people sort of use them like in bed if you're struggling to get comfortable at night because your back's hurting, then yeah, pop your TENS machine on. Just make sure that you've got um, a good supply of batteries because you don't want it to run out of battery. You've been using it beforehand um, when you really need it in labour. Thank you. Um, there is another question to TENS machine, so I'll just read this first. Um, okay. How specifically placed do the pads have to be? If they're about right, is that enough or do they have to be spot on? No, about right is um, is fine. It's, it's not sort of quite so specific as perhaps like you know an acupuncture type treatment. Um, you will gen. I think you would probably be able to feel whereabouts on your back you want them. So it's easiest if you get your partner to put them on. Um, but I bet you'll be able to feel on your back when he's putting them on whereabouts you want them. So you can sort of say to him, oh, just a little bit higher, a little bit lower, and they are, once you put them on, you can usually um, readjust them. Like once they're on, they're on. Um, you can then usually take them off and readjust it if you needed to. Thank you. Um, what's the temperature of a birthing pool? So the birthing pool, we try to keep it um, at around about body temperature. So about sort of 36, 37 degrees, um, around about that. So that when the baby is born, actually the babies they come out and they are usually so calm 
and I'm, I swear they don't know they've been born. Um, they're still in that warm water. They don't get that sudden shock of cold air that they would get if they were born on dry land. And then they usually come up and into your arms. And because the water's kind of quite high up on your chest, they remain mainly under the water with their heads above the water. And of course, the cord and everything's under. So quite often they come out and they're just so relaxed. Um, they don't do all that screaming, but um, yeah, about 36, 37 degrees, which is quite pleasant while you're in labour. And going back to what you said about the birthing pool, it is amazing. It literally, the second I got into it, yeah. I felt that weight from my tummy lifting. Yeah, and it it's just like, oh, wow, yeah, isn't it? It's just, the relief is immediate. <laughs> is. And I thought, how can water be a pain relief? Yeah, yeah. Really, yeah. it is. It, and, yeah, it is, definitely. It's such a shame I had to get out, but yeah. I was going to <laughs> It did, it did its good for you though while it, uh, it while it lasted, didn't it? Then I had to go and sit on the toilet. I'm not having my baby on the <laughs> toilet. <laughs> and I didn't. I managed to make it to the bed. Yeah. Um, Charlotte, I think your question's already been answered about where the birthing pools are available during this time. Um, might be a daft question. Is my partner or the midwife, would they massage the essential oils? So who would massage the oils? So um, it might depend if so um, the midwife, if she's providing the essential oils, the aromatherapy, she needs to be trained. Um, so it's something um, that quite a lot of the midwives working in Leicestershire have done, but not all. Um, so obviously your midwife needs to have been trained in that. Now, some of the midwives are happy to do the massages. Obviously, at the moment, it's a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of a, you know, with the social distancing and things, it's obviously difficult to massage somebody from a distance. Um, I have, however, I have massaged people recently um, in labour. It's probably a little bit of a personal preference. So, you know, ask your midwife. But, but if she is aromatherapy trained, then she would be able to make up a blend that then your partner could then use. Um, to massage you if she doesn't want to, to do it herself or isn't able to do it herself. Um, the other thing is that the midwife is often busy doing other things as well. So we have to still keep up with writing in our notes and, you know, doing other bits and bobs. Um, so, you know, we must do sort of 10 or 15 minute massage and then we have to do a little bit of notes and things. So if your partner is able to do the massage, um, then, you know, they're able to carry on doing the midwife can carry on sort of listening to baby's heartbeat and you know doing all the observations and writing in the notes and things if anybody wants specific blends or anything making up then to take with you in labor because it could be that there isn't a midwife that's trained um and available um to you if anybody wants any blends making up or anything that you might want to use perhaps at home before you you can taper, then by all means get in contact with me. Um, I'm, I'm able to sort of make up blends and send through the post and things. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I think you have covered this, but just to confirm, it's only gas and air and pethidine that are available at St Mary's. It is, and the therapy and the birthing pool. Um, but one of the other major bits of being at St Mary's is it is just a really calm and relaxing place to be you haven't got all of those noises um that you know the hospital noises it doesn't feel like a hospital it's a bit more like being at home um if you're in the hospital you can probably hear other ladies who are in labor um you can hear buzzers going off you can hear people you know walking up and down the corridor outside whereas at saint mary's it is just so quiet so you know so calm and so relaxing that you are able to just be more relaxed and, and get on and concentrate on what you're doing rather than you know having to worry about what's going on in another room and you can hear a buzzer going off and I wonder what's happening there you know and you you're sort of a little bit more tense and being tense like I've been saying all the way through it makes you it makes that pain worse it is so important to be relaxed and if you've got a good you've got a cat behind you now <laughs> It, it's so important to relax during labour um, and if you've got a really good midwife who's really supportive um, you know she's she will help you um, to be relaxed um, and be able to deal with that pain a little bit easier yeah and I always say it but St Mary's absolutely amazing like all the yeah. staff there 
it's an amazing place to work you know it's it's midwifery at its best oh absolutely and like during labor and after care it's just yeah you can't fault it at all no. no it is an amazing place to work you're one of those so thank you for giving me such an easy labor <laughs> um during my labor i tried gas and air but felt that it wore off after about an hour is that normal yeah, you tend to find when you first start breathing it, it is quite effective and you think, wow, this is amazing. Why didn't I start using this earlier? However, if you keep using it, then the effects of it tend to tend to be less as the time goes on. So what I would usually advise with the gas is that you keep going for as long as you can with just the breathing um, and kind of stay gas for when you really, really need it kind of towards the end of your labour if you can. Um, if you're in early stages of labour and you're finding that you need pain relief, that is when the pethidine might be useful. Um, so that was injection um, because that generally sort of works for a couple of hours and it might delay you starting the gas and air. So sort of save the gas and air for more the end like I said as well, we don't like giving you the pethidine too close to the end of your labour um, because of the effects that it can have on your baby. So the pethidine, if you're in the early stages and save the, um, the, the gas and air for towards the end. It is good stuff as well. I was so scared yeah. to use it, but the second I did, I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, sooner? good stuff. <laughs> um, I know the answer is no to this one, but um, if you're induced, can you still go to St Mary's? So it very much depends on how and why um, you're being induced. So there are a few options available when it comes to being induced. Um, so basically, if you have been low risk and say you're just being induced because your baby is overdue, um, when you go into the hospital, if they either use the balloon method to induce you they're able to break your waters immediately then generally what they can do is actually let you go home at that point um, to wait to see whether your labor starts on its own um, and if your labor then does start on its own there is the option for you to be able to come to St Mary's still um, if however they've had to use any drugs to induce you so if they've used the pessaries or um, tablets or gel or anything like that um, then unfortunately, because of the drugs that are involved, we need to keep a closer eye on you and the baby. So, you know, there are some options. Um, and um, again, you know, I have given a couple of people some advice about um, if you're approaching an induction date, um, there are again, some natural remedies and aromatherapy and things that um, I can advise um, and help that might um, help help you go into labour so that you can avoid an induction um, altogether, which then, then of course, means that, yeah, you would be able to go to St Mary's. Oh, that's brilliant, because I didn't know that. When I went in to initially be induced, they said I had to stay there no matter what, and I was adamant I was they, going to St Mary's. They have, yeah, they have changed things um, a, a sort of fairly, over the last year or so, okay. um, they've changed, and the introduction of a new balloon method um, which wasn't available, I don't think, when you had Martha. That's a fairly that's a fairly new thing. Um, that's a talk for a whole nother day. <laughs> I heard about that the other day for the first time, and I was like, yeah. "What the hell is that?" Yeah, yeah. It does. It sounds. It sounds a lot worse than it is. Yeah. Um, and of course, it for it, which is much better for mum and baby. So then you could go to St Mary's. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, if you come across complications at St Mary's, what happens? So, generally, if you've had, so you're only going to be at St Mary's if everything has been 100% normal up until that point. So you can't go to St Mary's if you've had any problems during your pregnancy, if you've had, if you've got any medical problems or any medication, for example, um, which means that if you're low risk, you are at a really good, you know, um, place to have a normal delivery. At the end of the day we've been having babies for thousands of years and if if we if we didn't manage to have babies without any complications we'd have never have got to this point in our evolution is what i always say so it's generally us which causes complications 
Um, so, for example, if we induce you, or um, you're on sort of medication, or we've picked up any problems during your pregnancy. So, if there's problems with baby's growth, um, something like that, then we would advise that you don't come to St Mary's to start with. That you start at the hospital because there is some slightly increased risks that we've picked up. So, if everything has been absolutely fine, then you've got a real chance that you are going to have a completely normal delivery um, without any complications. That said, we are constantly monitoring you throughout your labour and if at any point we pick up any problems with you or the baby, we transfer you to the hospital at that point. What we don't do is you know, leave it for a little bit longer and see if, you know, see, see what happens. And then a little bit later, that problem becomes a little bit worse and a little bit worse. And then we're left in a, you know, in a dodgy situation where, you know, perhaps there is an emergency and we think, oh, I wish we'd transferred two hours ago. We don't wait for that to happen. We would transfer at the first sign of any, any issues, which would be rare because you know you wouldn't be at St Mary's if we were expecting there were going to be any issues and the majority of people can have babies without having any problems um so um, what, I can't remember what the um what the what the actual question what was the actual question um, just what happens if you come across complications okay so what um so if we do pick up any problems we would talk to you about being transferred to the hospital and um, that would either be um, Leicester, if you have been having all your care in Leicester. Um, we do also do transfers to um, Queen's Medical Centre from Melton because they're about equal distance. Um, so if you've been having care in Nottingham, we can, we can go that way. Um, and we would phone an ambulance, the same as you would if you had any other kind of emergency. And then we transfer you ambulance over to the hospital midwife comes with you in the ambulance for the transfer to make sure that you get there nice and safe and sound we don't just wave at the door and say best of luck um so you know but we also say that we keep a really 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 close eye on all the ladies that are, are laboring at saint mary's um and you are guaranteed at St Mary's that you will have one midwife that is looking after you. Um, she hasn't got other ladies that she's looking after. At, at the Leicester hospitals, at the bigger maternity units, it might be that your midwife is looking after two or three ladies at the same time, which means that she's not able to be with you for 100% of that time um, and means that she's less likely perhaps to pick up on any of those little subtle changes um, that might be happening and if we pick up any of those little subtle changes that is the point about transferring we don't wait for the emergency situation to occur you know we've already got you to the hospital before anything like that was to happen and I had that experience as well where, sorry um, yeah I gave birth at St Mary's and had to be immediately transferred to Leicester General and it was a really smooth yeah. experience. Uh, midwife yeah. went with me. She stayed with me till I felt happy, safe at the hospital, like settled yeah. in. And then as soon as I was able to, I went back to St Mary's. I think it was like the next day or two days after. I can't remember. Yeah. Um, yeah. I stayed there for a few days, so it's it's really like calm and it's not like a massive yeah. rush to get to the hospital or anything. I think it is it is thing that everybody worries about obviously um you know what if something happens and all the doctors aren't there and things but what it's important to remember is that emergency situations don't generally just occur completely out of the blue when everything has been a hundred percent fine and normal so you know i don't know whether you watch one board every minute but you know occasionally that panic button goes and the room fills with 100 people and they're suddenly tearing off down the corridor to theatre for an emergency caesarean. But if you look at that story, the build-up to that, it didn't go from, you know, everything was absolutely fine and she was having a lovely natural water birth and all the rest of it and then suddenly she's running down the, th down the road to the theatre. You know, there was probably something during her pregnancy. There was probably something, you know, been picked up already during her labour, which meant that she was at an increased risk of that happening to start with. 
Um, and just a question I've seen in the group a few times, with having to have an ambulance to the hospital if you do need to go, is that still the same with all this coronavirus going on? Is it still? It is, it is. So that is, um, it is one of the reasons that some of the uh, um, birth centres and home births have actually stopped their service. And that was because of the worry about um, ambulance transfer times being affected by coronavirus. However, um, they are having regular sort of updates from um, East Midlands Ambulance Service um, to make sure that they are still able to offer the same service to us um, for transfers as they would always be able to offer. If that was to change at any point, then we would have to then assess whether it would be safe to continue having um, bays at St Mary's. But as it stands at the moment, there's no suggestion that that is the case. Um, and it is, you know, something that we're monitoring. Um, so, no, the ambulance response times um, at the moment haven't been affected. That's brilliant, because I know a few people wanted to yeah. go to St Mary's and were concerned that yeah. they would have yeah, been no. No, but and the other great thing, of course, about St Mary's is that we aren't treating any um, COVID nineteen patients there. So if you've got any symptoms or you, you know you've got um, or you have got coronavirus, then you're not going to St Mary's. Um, all of those ladies are having to go to the main obstetric unit. So you know that's another bonus to being at St Mary's is that um, you're less likely to come into contact with um, people that have that have got the virus. Be the safest place to be then. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's yeah. all the questions that have come in, and I think that's been really insightful to, in detail as well. Um, so thank yeah. you very much for that. Um, thanks for your time. And okay. Well, so many people joined, so I think it was a good one to do. And people have learned. Yeah. I can see in the comments, people are like. I think it's. Like, I, think think it's I think it's one of those ones that everybody wants to know, don't they, about oh, the yeah. pain relief for labour? <laughs> yeah, definitely. And I'm so sorry that. <laughs> She's been a pain. She's fine. Like, she's she's fine. literally like passing me all sorts. Of <laughs> Bless her. So, thank you to you as well for just carrying on as normal when she's doing all sorts of on your big screen. Um, yeah, that's all right. Yeah, thank you so much for your time and thank you everybody for tuning in. If you've got any more questions, just pop them below. And Emma's in the group, so she'll be happy to answer for you. But have a lovely day, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.